Hey, what's up, Florian family? Welcome to the huddle. Uh, join me this week. Uh, we got a special episode, but join me as always is Daniel with Preferred Flooring, and I would say always Jose, but it's he's a little bit like me. It's not always, but he is <laughs> feeling the best. So, uh, and then we have Kathy Case uh, joining us today to discuss uh, estimating. So maybe um, you've got a small company or a big company, it really doesn't matter. We use a lot of these core principles in our business to make sure that we're checking the boxes, you know, kind of dotting the I's and crossing the T's. A lot of you may or may not know that estimating can be a service that you can, um, you know, hire out to a third party. and. I happen to know Kathy uh, in this regard, and I thought it'd be cool if she came on and kind of uh, gave us a few tips. Um, maybe it's software tips on which software she um, thinks is the best uh, for a beginner, um, and then which one's kind of intermediate and so on. Uh, and then also I'll just go over with uh, me and Daniel uh, discussing you know, some of the tricks of the trade, so to speak, um, and what you really want to do and what you do not. So, Kathy, welcome to the Thank huddle. You. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. Okay. Would you mind telling us just a little bit about yourself? Um, where you, when did you get into flooring? That's always a great question to ask somebody. <laughs> Um, I think we were still using stones and chisels with tablets when I got into the business. <laughs> I started in 1979 uh, legitimately. I'm third generation in the industry, so I was on my first project at the age of six watching Terrazzo go in. Um, I grew up on the ceramic tile side of the business, my grandfather having started the business in 1923. <clears throat> um, in 1985, I went from running my first project in May to running 50 union installers by September when my dad passed away unexpectedly. And it, it gave me a lot of education. I, I was fortunate to have a lot of people step up and, and help mentor me. And so for me at this point, I tried to do the same for others. I've worked in the ceramic tile industry as a beginning point, but I've also worked for flooring contractors as well. Having done everything from installing, estimating, project management, sales, and executive management. In 2009, I switched my focus to estimating after having been a member of the Construction Specifications Institute. During that time, I found talking directly with spec writers that it really wasn't their fault that the specs were so bad. They weren't given the time to be able to do the research. And so I recognize the importance of the estimating role for a company. And that's why I switched to estimating. After working for several prominent flooring contractors in 2019, I opened up the service with the intention of being an emergency resource so that when a company was overwhelmed with work or they were short staffed that they'd have a resource so that they didn't miss the opportunity to serve their client. After three months into the business, we started having people ask us for full time estimators. So we do offer service either way. That's a awesome story. Six years old, uh, watching Terrazzo go in and then you fast forward to, uh, you know, your your dad passing away and you happen to take over the helm of 50 union installers. That's that does speak volumes to the team you had. And um, and then so when you decided to get into the estimating or kind of, you know, branch off into estimating as a service, mm -hmm. you said that you were looking to just pick up some some uh, downtime for companies, right? time of need. 
Right. Where, what do you think is the biggest change that had to happen for companies to feel comfortable using a third party? Well, I have to tell you, the first thing is people feeling comfortable having estimating not done in the office. And I think COVID was a huge turning point for that. People were used to having everybody right there. They wanted their salespeople and their support team, their project managers to be able to walk right up to an estimator and get their answers on the spot. I will tell you when I ran teams of estimators, I did not allow that to happen. It's one of the greatest risks in making mistakes for an estimator to stop them in the middle of what they're doing and not have a really cleanly defined stopping point to go back to once they've changed their focus. Besides the fact that their mind is in that project and trying to switch into your project can take some time for that mental focus to get back into what you're asking. So that can be a challenge in and of itself. There's your first nugget, guys. Right. <laughs> Don't interrupt the estimators when they're estimating. Um, that's a. I happen to agree with you. I know that some some offices are a little louder. Our estimator actually put on the noise canceling headphones because we're in an open office setting and be in the zone. He, yeah, he's got to get in the zone. Uh, hey, Daniel, do you guys up there, who does your the main part of your estimating? Uh, it depends on the contractor. So we all handle our, our own contractors. So if, if, I'm, if we're getting bids through the contractor that, that I handle, I'll do a majority of the estimating. Um, as far as like the takeoffs and stuff like that, it's a team effort, whoever doesn't have anything going at a particular time and we've actually talked to Kathy about onboarding with her as well it's just we need to we need to pull the trigger because she said one thing at uh at ties this last time that I'll never forget because I you know I went up introduced and we're, we're talking and I was like man what I hope that you know I hope one day that we'd be able to afford you and she looked me in the eyes and she said you can't afford not to hire me I said yeah that's right like best takeaway from from that right there and i was like i'm gonna i'm actually gonna use that for when people ask me too like oh you're ex you're expensive i can't afford to hire you you can't afford not to hire me i think it's yeah. the same mindset that we have you know as installers is 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 that really it's i'm the best at, at what i do you can go ahead and keep on struggling or you can hire me right yeah <clears throat> So when you guys, um, I'm going to start from the beginning, just I know a lot of uh, the audience is likely uh, knows this part, but obviously most of this starts with some type of an invitation to bid. Um, there's even that first step, there are systems and processes that you can use to help keep yourself streamlined. There's services like Building Connected. Uh, we use just a bid calendar in Excel for a long time, and that works just fine. Assign your jobs and know who's working on what and management of all your bid invitations. Uh, as you get bigger, uh, we decided to actually have a coordinator that does nothing but that, that part, manage the bid invites and assign estimators to, uh, to bid the job, or does it go to uh, quantify with Kathy and have – have a takeoff perform there. So management of those is like that's step one. When you start getting into uh, the actual set of drawings and specifications, this seems uh, elementary too, but I would say the one of the biggest mistakes I've witnessed with estimators is not starting with the product and the specification and really knowing what you're going to get ready to take off. I've watched many of them just open up the set of drawings, go to the finish schedule and start just going. Um, so what's your thought on that approach? It seems to me um, it leaves a lot of room for error. I'd agree with you. With our team, they're required to go through the full set of documents and call out all the drawings, all the the details, the specifications that are specific to the scope of work so that they're familiar with that information. 
especially in the day of electronic drawings, it's not like the days of old when I started where you could just flip a page real quick. I do remember that time. I, I used to do manual takeoffs and run into the blueprint company to pick up drawings that got emailed to them from some GC. It, we got it so much better now. <laughs> and it's, it's, it does make it easy. Yeah, it takes a long time. I still know some people that would rather do it on paper and then it's like, the, the amount of time you spend just learning the software and the amount of time you would save later on, or like we say, like just hire someone out, like hire Kathy and then it just save, saves all that time. Yeah. Uh, Kathy. So anyway, what was, uh, what was your comment on that, Kathy, about just kind of jumping into a set of uh, a finished schedule on a drawing and just going for the takeoff you were yeah, I've seen that happen as well. And the tough thing is that you're not really aware of those details as much. So it you can miss something when you're rushing through to that point. If you're doing a TI project, it's carpet tile and base and resilient flooring. It's not that big a deal. But when you're talking about a school or a hospital or assisted living, you really want to know those details it's time consuming to have to go back and change things after you've already done it one way when you actually see, hopefully you're seeing those details at some point in the review. Yeah. But not always, not all estimators go through the full set of drawings and, and that's definitely a problem because too many companies are relying on the estimator to really know the documents. Would you say it's really beneficial on a, for a flooring project and let's say it's a um, it's a remodel uh, so you have a demo set and uh, you have your architectural drawings do you guys kind of follow uh, the the um, the school of thought that all the architectural drawings apply or do you only look at the things that are relevant to the flooring piece the tough thing is demo drawings often have scope of work for the flooring contractor that you won't find in the architectural drawings. Something as simple as the responsibility of the demo itself will be identified more likely in those demo drawings. Or the scope of work for what's being demoed in the existing area, you can't assume that everything is being demoed. And hopefully it's going to give you an idea of what the material is that's existing now versus um, you know, what you're going to be dealing with for the new finishes. It's Man. key for understanding the installation process and the materials that you're going to need to be able to install that finished product. It would be awesome yeah. if architects actually put on there the existing material that's in the space. All it usually says for us is match existing. Match. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say that I see a lot of patch and match. Uh, that type of stuff is if you're doing a partial reno, um, that's where that information is typically. They don't um, model up the floor plan as much. Um, it's certainly in there. I mean, architects are like, you know, children. They have, they all have their own personality and how they approach things and how they present things. Um, and it's, but in general, it's a good idea to make sure you're reviewing your demo drawings and the, um, almost the full battery of uh, architectural drawings at least get familiar with the things outside of your finished floor plan and your elevations uh, that's that's where when i first started estimating that's all i cared about where's the finished floor plan where's the elevation and then you figure out quickly that finished floor plan has a different material than what's in the specifications and yeah so there's a go ahead kathy yeah, I just wanted to point out that when it comes to ceramic tile, you have to take it a step further. Oftentimes you need to go to the structural plans or the plumbing plans, structural, if there's a recess for a mud floor to know what the extent is and how deep that recess is, and the plumbing plans to understand what's happening in shower pans or any kind of gutters, things like that. So when it comes to ceramic, you have to take it the extra step yeah, that's a good point. There's there's a lot more information that you have to figure out when it comes to, you know, mud setting, uh, showers, and where the plumbing 
Yeah, you know, I've even found it helpful from uh, identifying the um, the uh, wall mounted toilets. Those things are way harder to cut around than a hole in a floor. And so we started like really looking for those because they can be a real pain. You got to get the best way to do it is get a template from the plumber so that you can mark it out. But it's it's a it's kind of a pain compared to just cutting around a hole in a floor. And so it's even that kind of stuff you see on the plumbing drawings that you don't see uh, the pattern of that uh, wall mounted toilet on it, even a set of elevation sometimes. So, yeah, we do Ceramic a lot of resilient. Top. So we're always looking for the trench plan. Mm -hmm. People don't think Ceramic that a lot of prep goes on them, but it takes a lot of prep. Yeah. Ceramic tile now is combining the actual drains into the tile work as well. And you also have those preformed shower pans that depending on where the, the drain is located or what the type of the drain is, the shower pan has a huge cost difference. So that's yeah. another when you need to be looking at those plumbing plans. Yeah, and so uh, nugget number two is like really review the drawings, try to know what you're looking for, um, understand what products you're looking at. Uh, just a few pitfalls I remember when I sat at, uh, you know, a, a drawing table all the time was stuff like them calling out bullnose um, on a series that doesn't make bullnose. And then uh, I actually one time had to go pay to have it made uh, because I didn't bring it up. And they didn't care that the that tile did not come with a bull nose. They asked for it, and they knew that they can be made after market, and that's what they made me do. So it's stuff like that where you can just cost yourself. Um, so being real detailed and getting to know, there's a lot, today's a lot better. I mean, we just w kind of got, I'd say, 80% through an integration with Measure Square, Spec Intel, and Structure, which is our kind of software stack at Stewart & Associates. And so there's a lot more tools today like Spec Intel um, that can really give you the information about that, that flooring, the tile, whatever it is. So we got good, getting through the drawings, um, you know, and, and really reviewing those. What is, um, what's our next step? And I know that we could go for two hours on this, but just so we step through the process of best practices here. What's what would our next step be in your one of your guys' minds? Actually, decide if the project is for you. Oh, that's like a that, good that's one. one of the I didn't biggest, think of that. That's one of the biggest things. Like uh, you get so many that come across, you know, and it's like look at the print, read the manual. Is this project for me? And you have to decide that and say no. Like, um, th th I think that's one of the big things is realize that when you do get, you know, a request for a proposal that there's an option there to say no. And these companies are counting on you to either accept it or not. So that way they know if they need to find someone else. Yeah, a good nugget there is tell them, though, if they've sent you directly an invitation to bid and you didn't find it on one of the bid boards, online bid boards, out of respect and letting them know that you you do not plan on bidding the project. Uh, that That's a good point too. I didn't even think about that. I got to give you some props, bro. Like you decide whether or not you want to bid it. So let's assume we made that decision. We want to bid the project. Um, what's the next, what's your guys' next kind of major step? I think one of the things you need to do if you've already gone through the drawings and looked at all the details is really understand those details and see where the conflicts are. I'm not saying if there's conflicts, I'm saying where they are because they're going to exist no matter at what level. And that's the time you want to try to get your questions going because there's usually RFI deadlines. And even if there aren't, you want to give your customer, the GC or the end user, the time to be able to do their research. When you're seeing the conflicts, I would suggest that as you're proposing them, you give enough information, drawing details, um, where 
you know, if you're seeing a conflict between two different pieces of information, you're listing both of those pieces of information and provide a potential solution. If you just go to them with a problem, in their mind, they have to start at square one. But if you've given them a potential solution, then they're starting to think about whether that solution is something that they agree with. And it's easier for them to process what they really want to do, whether it's your choice or it's some version or something totally different. It just builds tends some to goodwill with an architect too. You do, you definitely do. But it, it, it just speeds the process along by proposing a solution. I, I skipped over a piece. How long before bid date do you think your standard, uh, let's just call it your, your, let's use something that I think a lot of people can relate to, like a four story courtyard by Marriott. Don't uh, consider all the uh, economies at scale that you get because you probably bid a hundred of them. But let's just say it's your first courtyard. It's a project I think people can image in their head. How long do you think now that we have this timeline for the RFIs, you know, because just to build on what Kathy said, these RFIs typically it's seven days before bidders when they're due. Some of it will go to three and some don't state, but that means you got to be planning, which is what I'm building on here is planning out your estimating. Um, but how long would you say, Kathy, and I'd love your input too, Daniel, on a, on say a four story standard courtyard by Marriott, when should you start your uh, estimating process? The sooner the better, because it does give you the time to ask the questions. I mean, ultimately, um, when you're looking at materials, hopefully one of the other steps that you're doing in this process is reaching out to the manufacturer. That should be in the part that Daniel was talking about when you're making the decision whether or not to go ahead with the project. But you want to have an idea um, how long it will take for you to get the pricing back from the manufacturers. They just about all the time now want quantities before they're going to give you pricing. So if it's going to be something that they can turn around in a few hours, a few days, you, you need to know that to be planning from the pricing perspective. Yeah, I would agree that this, the sooner the better, right? Because um, typically with the the bids that we've been getting, your your timeline is not very much. So we get, you know, one or two weeks to do it and you got to figure that at least two of those days you're going to be waiting on reps right depends on what rep some of them answer you right away some of them you have to bug them like two or three times two or three days in a row and that that's the big thing what kathy said is they want quantities so sometimes you know when it's a, a super fast track project like sometimes they'll email and say hey we didn't get anyone to give us numbers for this. Will you just help us out real quick? The bid is due tomorrow. So I'll get right into the emails with the reps and saying, this is the material. This is the architect. I don't have quantities yet. As soon as I get them, I'll let you know. I just need the price. Yeah, I found with reps that if you can get close. So I do, I'll use Bluebeam. Um, and maybe Ashlyn can uh, send post links on our social for the for quantify and some of the um, other uh, softwares and services that we use so but um, I use Bluebeam as a PDF reader and measurer to get what I call common sense takeoff I'll take off an entire floor and then take off a couple of, of the the bathrooms and then just do the 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 math just to obviously not as a full takeoff, but just to give them close numbers. If you're within a couple hundred yards, it's not gonna make a big difference on your project. But um, I guess <clears throat> without a, a, a for sure time frame, we've always tried to use eight days on like a 45, 50, 60,000 foot project. Um, day one, get in, get your, a, at least alert your reps that you're going to be needing pricing and some of them will send it to you actually without quantities and and uh but shoot a quick email to your reps and you know we get into it pretty i think pretty late in the 
in the game here, seven, eight days before the bid is due. Um, gives a couple of days to get pricing and your RFIs can be running at the same time, but then you still need to build out your spreadsheet or whatever method you're using to assemble the numbers, which we'll get to next. Um, and then type up a professional bid form or proposal, and then make sure you have all of the bidding general contractors, or are you bidding this direct to an owner? Uh, are you bidding it to a CM at risk? Uh, what kind of project is it? And that's another value of knowing the, the specs early on and getting in there. Uh, <laughs> we've had uh, one of our estimators send a bid out to a bunch of GCs that were actually bidding portions of the job to a much larger GC on a huge project and thought that all the GCs, these three GCs were bidding it when in fact they were doing like the interior package of the entire building. And then this GC was doing all the flat work and still erection. And so it, it, it can help you uh, get your head wrapped around who you're sending your bid to and make sure you are. Um, so I, I say eight days, but that's probably because that's just how we do it. <laughs> I think that's a good time frame. Again, thinking of all the parts and pieces that go into the process, because you do have a couple, uh, some period of time to analyze the documents to determine if it is a good opportunity to make your connections. Then you're going to need a day or two at least on the estimating side. Then going ahead and getting your pricing, putting it together. Um, if there's any kind of breakouts required, God forbid there's an addendum or some other new information that's provided. Or 14 Maybe. alternates. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So that, that is definitely time consuming. As a general rule, you should be allowing yourself at least two to three days to review the estimate, put the proposal together, and get it out the door. And that's without it being a public job where it's a public bid opening. You yeah. never want those to be the last minute because you run the risk. I've seen too many times when somebody walked in a minute past closing time and they missed the opportunity to bid the job. Even when they're due online, like we uh, submitted one to the one of the colleges over here and it says everything has to be submitted online. And I went on there, you know, two hours early and I keep on trying to submit and it's like just not, not doing anything. And then by the time it finally loaded through, it was like, 10 minutes passed and it, I was, I was like, now what? They, Did it go through? Um, I was able to get a hold of the guy and let him know kind of what was going on while it was happening. So he still let us go through. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, that's why I wasn't on the bid uh, or on the huddle last week or I was on for a short time. I should say the week before. Yeah. Uh, last week you were on a plane. Last week I was in the air flying uh, yeah. from Memphis. So, uh, but the week before, we had let a job slip through the deal, uh, and this is why this this is why it's so important. And we really drove this home with our estimator to read your specs and your drawings ahead of time. Is a if it's a if it's a public opening the location and the directions on how you are to submit that bid is all in the specifications. Number one, number two, that's also where you find all your alternates. And, you know, if you have four or five alternates on a job, it's going to be in the specs in section zero 100 typically. And if you have four or five different ways that they, they want this bathroom as an alternate, but without the tile in the shower, they want a fabricated shower, but then they want another alternate for just the shower. And then, you know, when you start parting and piecing this thing together, it helps you to uh, do your takeoff the way that you're gonna have to bid the job. So I think all that's important. And we get the job downloaded, loaded up, eight days go by-ish. We, we got our bid back whether we uh, outsource the takeoff or not, we put our bid together. Um, what are some important items that every bid form should have? Daniel, I'll let you start because you're still in the flooring uh, bid 
you know, business. Kathy does mainly the estimating at this point, but I do want your take on this. Exclusions. You need to let them know, like, right up front, like, inclusions and exclusions, because this is what it's included. If it's not listed, it's not included. This is what's excluded. And we have been into that where we do this and all they do is look at the number and say yes or no and then once they say yes then you're you're starting to go through stuff and they're like well when are you going to be here to do this and be like we're not going to do that that's excluded like i'm not and and that's yeah if they snuck it in your contract that's a problem though right and that that's where once we you do get to the contract part read the read everything so that way like um we're doing a, a job that it's almost going to the next phase right now but when uh when we we won it and then he started asking questions and i'm like uh he's like who told you to spec a new carpet i said you guys did it's it's right there on the bid form even like it's in the spec it's in the bid form and it and it read like the alternate was to spec a new carpet for the installation on the entire building instead of just the renovation phase. And he was like, I don't understand where you got to spec a new carpet from. I said, read it again. And then you decide where I got to, to spec a new carpet. So I guess that that's one of the big things is if you do read something like that, there's no dumb questions. Right. And I, I would drive that like you can you can think one thing, but until you ask them what they meant by it, it's all up to interpretation. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Be willing to ask the questions. So I agree that the exclusions and exclusions, uh, inclusions, exclusions are like the mo one of the most important things. I think a properly laid out bid telling them what you're bidding. Uh, are you bidding per plans and specifications? And then you don't list all your materials. You just, the, when a job has heavy specified products, so it's not on a, maybe it's on a finished schedule still, but it's, it's in the spec book and they've taken the time to really lay out every product in the spec book. Then I'll bid per plans and specifications. And then my exclusions matter, right? Because then they can know, what in this spec section, if I'm bidding 09 3000 and that's ceramic floor and wall tile, and I exclude, you know, waterproofing on the first floor or, uh, you know, something, whatever it is. The, the real important part is that they have a spec to go see why, where it's excluded from. Uh, when you're just listing your materials and say you got, Dow tile this, Dow tile that, whatever the products are, and you're actually listing out the products. Um, and that's a way to do it as well. But you got to be a little more careful with your exclusions, I think. And that is, we added a box on our bid form that says job specific exclusions and then our standardized, mm. these are our exclusions on every job. So, and then of course the price, who are you addressing it to? Are you addressing it to all bidding general contractors? Are you addressing to the estimating department? I would encourage you, as long as you don't have eight or 10 different GCs, if you got two or three, personalize it. Hey, it's this guy, you know, it's Daniel Gonzalez at J.E. Dunn. And so a little personalization is, is uh, uh can go a long way as well but the main thing is obviously the price and scope and then the uh inclusions exclusions what about you kathy do you have any other like add-ons to that that we need to be careful for well first and foremost i want to comment on your personalizing because i think that is important even if you have eight or ten bidders if two or three of them are people that you work with regularly make it personal make it addressed directly to them um, because they want to feel important, quite honestly. So I would personalize it. Um, when it comes to the, the exclusions and inclusions, you want to be real careful to include how you've handled any conflicts in the drawings. If it's not been addressed in an addendum that becomes part of your contract drawings, 
you can't assume just because you had a conversation with your client that he's going to remember at the time of award that that's how you had agreed to handle that situation. Not only do you want it in there and clearly identified why you have that, um, how you've come to that conflict resolution, but when you're before you sign the contract, you want to be sitting down with them and making sure that you've reviewed those conflicts and that everybody's in agreement with the way that you've addressed it so that you're getting that result before you're on the job site, before it becomes, you know, potentially a, an ugly situation about the cost and who's going to bear that. That's a good point because you don't always get your RFIs answered. I mean, frankly, uh, particularly if it's coming close to the, uh, you know, end of the bid uh, date. But I, I know some architects that just don't answer subs RFIs. They make us send it through uh, one of the general contractors and then that general contractor flooring we're the last thing on maybe not the last thing but we're one of the latter things on their mind when they're building a uh, facility and so we send in an rfi that has to go through the gc because an architect's somewhat of a pompous then you know you may not get the answer so you have to learn to make it intelligent assumptions and then detail out what that assumption is would you agree that that's kind of what what the best method is when you when you don't get an answer to your question absolutely and again even if you get an answer from your client but it's a verbal answer or even an email you want to make sure that you're including it the only time that i feel it may not be necessary is at least if it's documented in an addendum or an rfi response yeah. You want to protect yourself and you need it for your own reminder as well because you're going through how many projects, not only bidding, but construction side as well. So you need that kind of tickler to remind yourself when you're getting back into that project that those items need to be resolved. Yeah. yeah I even put on ours, you know, that it includes this addendum dated this day so that way they don't have to come back and ask me, hey, does it include this? Hey, does it include that? Yes, it does include this and it's already listed in there. Yeah, list your addendums, list your, um, if you got a lot of alternates and only five of them apply to you, I would encourage you to say you got 10 and five apply to you. I would list all 10 and no change on the ones that don't affect you. And then that saved us before because we thought we didn't have anything on this uh, alternate, but in fact we did. And, um, you know, it was helpful that the GC seeing that we didn't have a number in on that, it just kind of laid it out. If you got a couple alternates, just obviously making sure that we, we log our alternates and, and the pricing for that. And then like Daniel just said, make sure they, you recognize the addendums. And then in, even in the project manual, sometimes you'll run into, you know, the job specific bid forms and you have to use that bid form. They don't want anything else. And that's where, uh, you know that they're going to be a huge stickler on price i've been finding out is because they want that bid form they want the number any alternates that's it they don't care about anything else they just want to see that number yeah well those are dangerous and i just i always send our qualification sheet with it even if it's their bid form and i'm like i've written it on the bottom of the bid form that our our uh um uh, our explanation sheet must be considered with this number or else just throw our shit away. <laughs> I mean, basically, you know, there's too many, there's too many things, too many ways to get caught on that deal. And if you're, some of this is like, as you build a relationship with your GCs uh, and you have a, a good solid relationship with someone, they're going to call you and discuss things I had a call last week on a bid from one of my estimators, you know, they'll call you and let you know you're kind of something's wacky or, you know, did you look at it this way? Did you look at that? Um, so that's part of, you know, the final thing is personalizing that bid form is for what? To build a relationship because like Kathy said, they want to feel important. We all do. And a lot of estimators are just sitting behind a computer screen for eight, 10 hours a day, guys. So like throw them a little love. And <laughs> so personalize it, but that's to build a relationship. That's one of the things that does. It's you're recognizing that other human. And that can come 
really in handy from a perspective from the perspective of if you did mess something up they'll call you you know i i had a job that uh we're not sure until we, we get through whether i was right or they the uh, the competitor was right but we had polar opposite bids from a price perspective and there was only two bidders it's kind of the worst scenario for me i was low but like 20 something percent low and they were high. And I'm like, okay, which one of us made the mistake here? They called me. I looked at mine and went over it with the estimators. Uh, I feel really confident that it's fine and that we had everything covered. But at the end of the day, those relationships that you build by acknowledging other people can come in handy and really save your rear end. Yeah. I've had those calls too, where they, they call and they, they like working with you because you do build that, you know, that, that bond with these people. And they call you and they're like, hey, I just want to let you know that right now, you know, you're not, you're not the lowest. You're, you're, you know, little, you're, you're kind of right in the middle. And I'm not telling you that you need to lower your price on anything. I just want to let you take a look at everything to see if there was something that you added that shouldn't be there. Yeah. So, so relationships 100% matter. Yeah, you'll get those calls. Um, you know, I would, you know, say be very careful. Uh, I want to be clear what bid rigging is and what that is actually. And a contractor calling or just talking to on a on a normal project, talking to a, a sub about the job, if they're not sharing you know, specific numbers or something, the key that that's not bid rigging by calling your client or your, uh, your flooring vendor, for example, and saying, Hey, can you relook at this? The fact is, is that they know you're going to do the job right. And when GCs do that, it's typically because they want to deliver the best value for their client. They don't want all the headaches and the being short or the, you know, the things that happen when you, when they have to deal with another, uh, provider. So at the end of the day, that that's not bid rigging. Uh, I would say it's very much frowned upon in the industry, but it's not an illegal activity. Now, if Daniel and I got together and we're bidding the same GC and him and I said, hey, listen, 60% profit, baby. <laughs> and we went in and we were, we knew we were the only two bidders and we both bid it way up there. Like that's bid rigging. <laughs> That is illegal and will land your ass in jail. <laughs> yeah. And we know I know of a of a very large company in Chicago that this it's pretty well known, uh, but this happened to, and I believe it was their VP that went. He did some time. Yeah, and like I said, he didn't tell me any dollar amounts. You know, he's just like, is there anything that you could have had in there that shouldn't be in there? Like you you added something twice or something, just. And he just, you know, they that the big thing was, I love working with you guys. I would love to see you on this project, but ultimately, it's not my decision. But if you could see Second if you look. added anything in there. Second look. Yeah. Well, you get those opportunities to, to uh, you know, work with your contractor. But I just wanted to be clear because I've heard people say that, like, well, that's bid rigging. It's not. Uh, and it's not illegal. That activity. Like I said, it's pretty frowned upon or it can be frowned upon, but the dirty secret is every flooring company I've ever talked to, it happens. I was at a conference with a hundred and, I don't know, what are we up to? 160 contractors at that place. They, there was a certain discussion where it was all talked about. Well, yeah, the contractor calls me and wants me to lower my price and, you know, get closer to the low guy. Um, so what I would say though is, building the relationship can come in handy the the example i was giving was like i because there was only two bidders right they didn't know if this guy bid it high or if i missed something you know and they don't have a third or a fourth to be like okay these are grouped together and this guy's way low so he's probably the outlier it was just two of us and we both have pretty good reputations i see pretty good on their side our reputation's awesome <laughs> <laughs> but uh the so they called to give me a chance to look at it before they you know put me in as the low bid and that you know can save your bacon sometimes 
Um, and that, that's one thing, too. It's, you know, once you do find out that you don't win something, definitely ask them, well, how much was I off by? And sometimes they'll give you a percent. Sometimes they'll give you a dollar amount. And you're like, man, you can take that percentage and be like, man, I was only, you know, 3% off and I lost this bid. And that, yeah, that gives you a, this or that, you can find some ways to tweak yeah, it a little bit. That, that gives you a chance to relook at that project and be like, what could I have done differently and still been profitable but got this job? And that's really the, the biggest thing that we've been dealing with lately is learning from the projects that we bid that we didn't get to go forward and still maintain, you know, the profit that we need in order to run, but getting it, getting the projects that we want. And maybe the holy grail of estimating is don't do free shit. Like, <laughs> do not do work that you think you're going to lose money on or that it's so tight. If you have a project that has seven alternates and there's 12 gcs bidding and it's some big you know project that is like a mainstay in your area like a new library or you know a new college dorm or something that would get accolades and there's all these walk away sometimes it's just best to walk away when you got all these alternates which tells you the owner wants to see it 15 different ways right uh owner or architect and then you're G, you got eight or ten GCs. That's telling you right there they want the bottom dollar price. You have, unless you most likely mess something up to be low, you're not going to get the job anyway. So I think that plays into it as well. Early on, get in and out of projects if you can't do them. When it comes to public bids, you know you get a one shot at the price and. I'll tell you when I was on the contracting side, one of my favorite projects, I knew one of my competitors wanted that job. It was in his hometown. He didn't want somebody else on that job. It was for my favorite client. They considered me their favorite tile contractor. And so when it came time, we, we put a price on it as a convenience to them because they want to show their customer that they have plenty of um, participation in the bid. And so I put the right price on the job. I did not try to be tight on my number. And what ended up happening was we were third low bidder. The first bidder, which was the person I knew was going to be aggressive, missed the entire lower level of the school, which was locker rooms, um, swimming pool decks. And so he got tossed. The second low bidder missed 7,000 feet of epoxy grout. So he got tossed. What started out as a $290,000 bid ended up being almost $700,000, and I was third low. The point being is that being the low number does not necessarily gain you the bid in a public situation because a good contractor is going to qualify the scope of work that you have. You want to make sure that you've covered the job properly and priced it properly and then go in with the right number. Yeah, lowest qualified bid. Right. <laughs> and they'll, right. they'll tell you, because we've talked about it too, because on the public jobs, you're putting in a, a bid bond, and then if it's over a certain dollar amount, you got to do the performance bond and stuff like that. And it's the, and we've talked to them. They're like, we typically don't use the bid bond because we'll just toss them out and be like, yeah, you're done with this one. He said, but... In certain cases, when, when we need to, we'll definitely use that money. Yeah. I've never had one uh, used, but because um, I don't pull out of bids, I've, you know, frankly, I've, I've, we've made mistakes and I've done a loser job before uh, just to maintain the, the relationship. Um, well, we're, we're, Closing in on an hour already, guys. I got a question um, with, you know, what we've we've talked about the importance of building the relationship at the end of the project. What is your best comeback when they say, "Oh, we can't tell you that"? When you ask for uh, where you landed, this is kind of a silly question, but I'm just curious because I got my go-to. I don't know. Yeah, they, just, they, they usually just tell me. <laughs> you you don't have GCs to say, oh, I can't tell you that. No. 
So we, we will. They'll be like, well, we can't share that with you. And I'm like, okay, so you're saying you cannot share with me where my competitor landed. Are you in a, you were in an opening with all your competitors and <laughs> you've got to hear all of theirs. Uh, we are only trying to get better. That's where I lead to is like, we're only trying to get better. I'm not, I've lost this job. If I've lost this job, that's got nothing to do with it. We are just trying to increase our performance from a getting jobs or bids in on time and providing you with accurate numbers. That's all. So any real guidance that can help us become a better, uh, you know, bid resource for you, because see, just like you alluded to, Kathy, the GCs, a lot of their reputation when if they're bidding to a owner is how many subs can can they get those three subs to come and give them three numbers on each scope? And, mm -hmm. you know, the owners, they recognize that stuff. If a if a GC can't get enough subs to even get two or three bids, they know that, you know, there's possibly uh, some skeletons in the closet with that GC. Um, so. Yeah, I guess at the at the end of the day, that's what I tell them. I've asked them in the past if they give that roadblock is to at least give me an idea. Am I two percent, five percent, ten percent, twenty percent? And oftentimes they'll at least give you a ballpark. They may not give you the exact number, but similar to what you said, you know, I explain to them that I'm trying to serve them, and if my number is not working for them, then you know, I need to know what I have to do to be effective for them. I always make it about them. When you yeah. make it about them, you don't make it about yourself. You have a better shot at getting the answers. Yeah, good insight. Well, uh, so we went from start of getting the bid invitation, and I know we didn't do any screen shares on actual takeoffs, uh, but I would like to discuss for the last couple of minutes here the best software stacks for estimating takeoff, PDF readers, that kind of thing. What are your favorites, Kathy? Because you do this with multiple different companies. So wait a second. If you cannot answer this, do not worry about it. I will answer my. I just realized the position I just put you yeah, in. I'm sorry. I, I answer it all the time because I've been asked when I was doing speeches at conferences. So, you know, I will tell you who it is and why it is there's great software out there and everybody's going to have their own ideas as to what is important to them but for me measure square has become my absolute favorite go-to as well as all of my estimators because we've experienced no glitches in their system and more importantly they're there to serve the industry if you can see a potential improvement in their software, they're going to hear you out and they're going to consider it. And more than likely, either, they're, either they'll adopt it or adapt it, one of the two. That's really important. The industry is forever changing. Softwares are changing. Products are changing. And so if you've got a software company that's going to work with you to try and make their product better, to serve you better, that's, that's key. That's huge. Yeah, that's awesome. I, am I, I would say the same thing with Measure Square. We've we've used some others in the past, but Measure Square is our favorite. Us too. That's what we switched over, I think, two or three years ago from a different program. And not only is it more user friendly, but like Kathy said, it's if you have an idea, they will absolutely hear you out. I mean, my brother's been on webinars with them constantly like, this is my idea. This will make my life easier. How can we get it into your system? And it's they're they're all about it. They're like you said, they're they're here to serve us, right? And they really show it. Yeah. They love your brother. <laughs> so do you use any PDF readers um or anything like that, Kathy? I don't I didn't know if I mean not just for reading documents, but we use Bluebeam. It's kind of a you can do some takeoffs with it. I, I do it to check estimators sometimes or whatever, but you can mark, I like it because I can mark up the drawings and put notes and cloud stuff out and I can cut stuff away and I can make the drawing what I need to make it because I'm always thinking about, okay, what is the installer gonna think when he sees this? That's just how I build things, so. 
you can actually cloud and make notes all over Measure Square as well. So there isn't that limitation. We don't typically use Bluebeam, um, not at least for flooring. We've started doing uh, drywall painting and ceilings, and in those um, we may apply it more because we're not typically using Measure Square at this time. A measure Square is now developing in a way to be able to be used for those other trades, but we haven't, the teams are not quite um, up to par on Measure Square yet for those trades. Gotcha. What about you, Daniel? Yeah, do you... typically we're doing Measure Square as well. Like That's where you make all your markups and stuff? Yep. So we, they have a, a notes option and then we'll like draw arrows to the, we'll draw an arrow and put a note out so that way people know exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. So uh, our estimators will do that kind of thing. But when I, as a, if I'm project managing in it, managing the job, I don't just, I don't have, I don't even have a mem uh, measure square login myself. <laughs> so I get the documents from the estimating, uh, the estimators and, you know, they're in PDF form uh or measure square file well if i don't have measure square i'm not going to be able to look at it there right. so i look in the pdf form and then i use Bluebeam because it can do all those markups and stuff uh it's a lot better than like an adobe or something like that although you can probably get a really high end of adobe uh to work for you but is, uh, is that software, software does that software have a cost to it Bluebeam? yeah yeah it's like I'd have, I had to remember it's like 300 bucks a year or something. It's okay. not extreme. <clears throat> not but. too bad, but yeah. So going from PDFs like that, when we're out on the field, we do have um, the measure square mobile as well. So we can pull it up on there, but if we don't have, if we don't want to do that and just doing the, a screenshot and marking it up with our phones is what we do. Gotcha. Well, it was a pleasure. We're going to have to wind this thing down to stay under an hour. It was a pleasure chatting with both of you about this and getting into the weeds a bit about how estimating, uh, you know, there is a way to do it. It's not the only way, but there are some best practices. So I hope that we shared enough with you guys so that you know what those best practices are. As always, if you have any questions for me, you can reach out at Paul at Go Carrera. Uh, Daniel, yours is Shoot your email again. Cause Daniel you know, at, like, we'll do just the easy one. Daniel at pfmi.team. Awesome. And Kathy, if somebody wanted to reach out to you for a service or maybe have you bid a few jobs for them and they're, you know, they're really busy or something, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? My phone number, which is 203-627-0067 or my email, which is kcase at quantifyna.com. And and uh, Kathy with a K. Kathy with a K, okay. <laughs> that's correct. So, um, all right, well, if you guys like the, the content that you got, I would encourage you, please help us out. Give us a like, you know, a thumbs up, whatever you're watching this on. Uh, one of the big realizations we've had over the last several months, me and the guys, is uh, people who consume this this uh, podcast in multiple different ways. It's it's YouTube, it's LinkedIn, it's Facebook, it's you know it's all over. Uh, so consider liking. Uh, if you're on on um, YouTube, consider subscribing. Uh, we do this for free every single week, every Tuesday at three o'clock Central. Kathy, thank you again for joining us. It was a real pleasure to talk through that with you. Daniel, tell your brother to get better, my friend. You too, and, man. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. All right. We'll boy. talk to you next week. And, Kathy, again, thank you for joining us. I'll see you in a week. Awesome. See ya. Bye. Bye-bye.